Hello there, everyone. This is Eugene Lucio, and welcome to episode 77 of Forensics Talks. Today, my guest is Frank Grosspeach, and we're going to be talking about investigating illegal firearms. Now, before we get started, I'm just going to make a few quick announcements here because uh, we got some things that are coming up and I uh, just want to make sure that everybody's aware. So there's some training courses that I'm working on and one of them, which is actually next week, Monday and Tuesday, is going to be the cloud compare course. So if you're working with 3D data, whether it's from photogrammetry or laser scanning, well, cloud compare is a great open source program that helps you to edit data, helps you to do different types of analysis, take measurements, all kinds of different things. So whether you're in accident reconstruction or you're doing crime scene investigation, whatever it might be, uh, this might be a course that's for you. So uh, you can just go to my website and that's uh, ai2-3d.com. And uh, yeah, just click on the link here. You'll see it and the training is there. There's also the training uh, link. If you click on that, there's some other things that are going to be coming up. I haven't really announced it yet because I don't want to just get people confused with too many courses, but there's the Recon 3D course that's going to be coming up on February 21st. So that is the iPhone scanning app. So if you have an iPhone uh, that is LiDAR enabled, so that would be like the iPhone 12, 13 or 14 Pro or Pro Max or an iPad Pro, you have a little scanner built into your device. And so you could use it and you could use the Recon 3D app. So keep that in mind. There's also a photogrammetry course that's coming up. And so that's for March 14 and 15. That's gonna be where we're gonna be learning 3DF Zephyr. Okay, so that's a program uh, that is from 3D Flow. Great package for doing all kinds of things, whether you're flying a drone for crime scenes or accident scenes, whether you wanna do close range photogrammetry, you know, small object, little pieces of evidence. Um, I basically go through everything there. So all you have to do is head over, head over to the website and um, yeah, you'll, uh, you'll be able to get that. All right, let me take that off the screen here. And now I'm gonna look at the comments here, make sure I can, I can see a bunch of people here or there. Hey, welcome everyone, thank you so much. And we've got people from Texas, we've got people from uh, Canada here, we've got people from the Caribbean. And uh, so welcome. So by all means, please uh, folks, put in where you're from, where are you watching this from? Are you in, um, wherever part of the world, if you're in Europe, uh, tell us the city or the country that you're from. And also as we speak with our guests today, uh, if there are any comments that you may have, please put them into the comments window and I will, uh, I'll vet them and then go kind of go through and pose them to our uh, guest. So let's talk about Frank Grosspeach. So Frank is a firearms expert with a comprehensive background in relation to the interdiction and investigation of illicit firearms uh, related components, ammunition, and he works at the local, national, and even international levers, levels. His expertise ranges in areas such as identification, classification, and verification of firearms, criminal use of firearms, firearms trafficking, black market value of illicit firearms, and much more. He spent over 14 years as a member of the RCMP's National Weapons Enforcement Support Team and retired in early 2020. Well, retired sort of because since April 2021, he's been working for the United Nations Regional Center for Peace, Disarmament and Development in Latin America and the Caribbean. And he's a technical advisor for both conventional weapons and for firearms evidence management. Now, I've only known Frank for a very short time, but in the recent discussions that we've had, uh, they've always been uh, very enthusiastic, very deep discussions on, you know, firearms, illegal firearms, and a lot of different things. And so I'm really pleased that he's here. I'm going to bring him in here. There he is. Hey, Frank, how you doing? Hi. Um, quickly. Um, to Gideon, I hope you are not buried under ice like a number of my compatriots down in uh, in Texas because uh, I saw what you guys uh, got and it was brutal. So I hope you're all good. Excellent. Just had to get that in because it was <laughs> incredible. Yeah, we're we're much more accustomed up here in the Toronto area to snow. We actually got a little bit uh, quite long, but we've been having quite a mild. Uh, a winter really but but frank thank you so much for being here really appreciate your time um yeah and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this particular discussion so uh let's let's begin with you and talk about your background a bit and then maybe we'll move on into a whole bunch of different topics that i have um were you so i was thinking about this last night are you were you a gun guy like growing up were you a kid that had guns all over your family was a hunters and stuff like that uh it's, yeah yeah no my father was a hunter, not large scale, grew up in, uh, in Montreal. And we grew up, he had a gun rack and it was three or four rifles, 22 shotgun, a bolt action 303 Lee Enfield. And there was one other, 
a Kui because I still have the Kui. And they were chained all together. And my dad, uh, cigar smoking, gruff German, he would, and I'd be looking at him and he says, if you want to see him, you come get me. We'll take them down. We'll handle them responsibly and you can handle them. And I'll show you how to handle them. And, but you never, never, you never play. And then pull them up. And, and it was funny that even transferred to the liquor cabinet where if you want to have a drink, you're going to have your drink with me. And we didn't touch the liquor cabinet. It was no. <laughs> um, so then, of course, uh, move on from there. I had gone out on a couple of hunts with him, but really didn't get that full into it. Uh, went into the military, uh, started off, of course, military police, then went into the Airborne Regiment, and I really started to hunt. I had these opportunities to travel all around Canada with work, around Europe, and was exposed to hunting lifestyles, where it came down to hunting and killing were two different things. Um, Hunting is the the whole endeavor of going out, prepping, going out, doing the scouting, do all the work and do all those, the, the, the really beautiful things, watching the sun come up, watching the sun go down, having a bird land on the barrel of your rifle and slide down, those sort of things. And then I got into archery and I've competed in a number of world uh, police and fire games uh, in archery. It just, firearms were, and then when, even when I was in the military, when we had, I was in Kosovo and doing the disarmament in Kosovo, doing the cataloging of the firearms for the United Nations. Then, I, you know, really getting hands-on even more so. I mean, you were getting everything from firearms from and ammunition and ordnance from World War One. We were getting mines, we were getting hand grenades. Uh, shoulder mounted rocket of all different nations, so it, all the, the small arm light weapons of a scale that were surreal. And the joke was that we even had one rifle, it was an old inline that there was probably still blood on the bayonet. <laughs> um, and then in Canada, um, I had come back from Kosovo. They told me, Frank, you're going to go to Afghanistan because you have combat experience. And my wife went, time out. Uh, we wanted to stay married. And we wanted to have a family. So did the training, uh, the exams for the RCMP. The RCMP said, we'll take you. The military said, not so fast. You have to stay with us for one more year to train up your team and your replacement. And then you can go. And so then off to depot, six months in depot, which was a different kind of place when you've already been used to polishing boots and ironing kit and everything squared away. And I, I, I can remember we were doing room clearing drills and we had some officers visiting depot and they pulled me aside and they go, where did you come from? And I told them and they went, it shows and it got to the point where i couldn't do certain drills because they had to let other people lead the teams so i would stand back and watch the drills going it was uh and then when i got into the firearm world world uh it was a sophie forte who tapped me on the shoulder and i was her replacement she recruited me and she said, you know this, you know how to handle them, you know the nuances. And then she said, you even know a little more because of the fact that you understand international norms, the, the movement of firearms between countries, um, end user certificates, diversion, all these sort of things. And I went, okay, I'll go for it. And for the longest time, I was based in Surrey and was a one person office. We had a member with VPD, we had a member on Vancouver Island. I had all of Vancouver, other than Vancouver City. I mean, all of British Columbia. And it was when we entered into the gang wars. We had uh, Project E-Pork, E-Portal, diverted military guns, E-Pork, uh, you know, almost uh, 1,200, 1,300 diverted firearms into the criminal market, which are still being seen to this day. And this is back in early, mid-2000. 
And it just got, I went, okay, I need to learn this. I need to learn this more and more and more and understand diversion. I was, rec you know, learning that certain religious groups in the Chilliwack Valley were trafficking guns or, and, or we had individuals that were actually brokers for illicit firearms. Mm -hmm. And it was learning, asking the questions, paying a, and it came down to the analogy, and I'm bad for analogies is I have a street. And if you are focusing on a unique commodity, in this case, illicit firearms, those firearms and those individuals involved will always cross your street. You just have to remember when. And that is where I took it. And the other thing was, is everything that I learned is not for me to keep. It's to pass on so that the next person is better than me. Right, right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what kind of, what were your roles during your time in the, like with, with all the firearms? Like did, did your, did your roles and responsibilities change during that time? Or are you pretty much doing the same thing the whole time you were there? It, it increased. So I went in as a constable and so I'm assisting uh, the RCMP federal operations uh, for uh, gun trafficking, uh, illicit movement across the board, U.S. Canada border, uh, I wasn't really in the international world yet because I hadn't my name got had really hadn't gotten out there yet of what I could bring to the table, and you know just the generals, firearm examinations, um, and and training, 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 going to Ottawa once twice a year or somewhere else, and just building up the skill sets and building up the skill sets. And then started being pulled into court. Then three of us, one in Ontario, one in Winnipeg, and myself, we were dealing a lot with uh, coded language um, between for illicit firearms, uh, homicides, all, all, anything firearms uh, related. And so the three of us actually put together for the federal government, for the Soul Jam, a dictionary on coded language and the dictionary had to be based on fact cases phone intercepts um, transcripts movie literature uh, music oh i'd be at home on a saturday and i'm listening to the latest street rap that's coming out of from the gangs in toronto or the street gang, First Nation street gangs in Winnipeg, and then subsequently uh, the Indo-Canadian gangs in Western Canada. And I'm doing the interpretations. I will get sent, Crown would reach out, and I'd have a stack of paper. And I'd go, Frank, here are the transcripts. And I'm going through the transcripts with a highlighter. And I'm going, sex talk, sex talk, sex talk. And there's a lot more sex talk than they're getting. And then you finally get gun. Whoa. And you get all excited and you highlight it. <laughs> and, just, you know, you go on, you go on. And because it comes down to a word doesn't mean anything. There has to be a context. So you always have to know what's going on beforehand, during, and after. And it's understanding what you're looking at. I, I mean, I had an individual here. And he was importing the Glock switches from the Philippines. Mark Glock, worked like a charm, metal fabrication. And he was importing them as light switches. And he was also fabricating suppressors, which he called mufflers. And his communications back and forth with the, the gentleman that he was converting firearms for and uh, doing, uh, putting on the Glock switches and putting on the, the, the suppressors or changing CZ858s from semi-automatic to automatic because he had the, 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 uh, the, the proper trigger sets to drop in. And it's, it's understanding what you're looking at because different people use different languages that may very well be unique to them. So then I also went out to learn, okay, uh, in Hispanic, Cuevo, uh, Ciano, you know, all the, the, the horns of the, bull, the, the, the goat, you know, for an AK-47, right, right, right. all these little things. So that was one thing. And then started really getting into, I was tapped on the shoulder and there was somebody who had tried to import into a trade show in Toronto, uh, a military track. And it had 
firepower mounted on the track. And they went, Frank, can they do this? And I went, no, they can't. And they go, how do you know this? And I went, go through everything. And I gave it to them and went, okay, good. And then that, from there, I got pulled into with Interpol. So when there would be Interpol requests for uh, the movement of money or small arms, light weapons, I get the tap on the shoulder, Frank, can you assist? And I would do my little bit. Um, yeah. And then I ended up writing the course standard for national weapons enforcement for doing the test fires of firearms. When they became analysts, this was the, the format they had to follow the pros, the cons, the safety factors, all things like that. And then two of us, because we're bilingual, uh, we ended up writing and establishing the core standard for the characteristics of an armed individual and have done reviews of videos, have been put in the back of a van to go to a gathering and go, Frank, what do you see? Um, shootings that have taken place, Frank, what, what has just happened? And doing the reviews and I've presented on that. I, 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 one of the guys, John Hurley and myself, I don't know how many hundreds of police officers we gave that training to for the Vancouver Olympics. Right. Um, right. It was, it was course standard at the justice Institute in BC. Um, yeah. And then it moved on. Then I ended up uh, going into a sergeant spot and then going into acting staff sergeant and the sergeant spot and staff sergeant was the ops sergeant for Western Canada. So of course you have a lot of the administrative duties and everything else, but they're still, the guys and girls still weren't at the speed where they could run to do it. So I was still, I was doing the administrative duties and then I was still doing the investigative support. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, for, uh, I was tasked for anything national security, anything on the IHIT, the integrated homicide team, and international, and then of course odds and sods. Okay, let me ask you about the the trends that you may have been noticing over the years, because obviously this is not this is not just a, a local problem. Obviously, there are countries like, uh, you know, the top the top offenders, let's say, or, or the top countries that have problems like Brazil, for sure, a lot of gun crime, United States, a lot of gun crime, Venezuela, Mexico, uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Canada, where does Canada sit in the in in, in that, um, let's say, overall internationally in terms of gun crime, in your opinion, I'm not looking for hard yeah. numbers, but, yeah. no, but also, what yeah. have you seen over your career in terms of the growth? Okay, so uniquely, gun crime in Canada is that unique across Canada. So let's put that first, paint that picture first. We have, well, let's start out on the East, uh, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, all that. We have a uh, hunting community. We have, that's principally what it is out there. It, okay, you have uh, a gang in Halifax um, that's been around for, for, for eons. Then you work yourself into, you have uh, Quebec. And of course, in Quebec, you have historically serious organized crime, not just with the mafia, but now you also have with the communities that have immigrated into the communities. I mean, I grew up for a while in Park Extension. It was all Greek. I went back there a while back with a bunch of mates. Now it's all Somalian. So it's completely changed. Um, and we look at, right, Montreal, if everybody thinks Toronto has a lot of gun crime, take a good look at Montreal. It's through the roof. Then we move into Toronto. And Toronto's unique because we have, I, I call them enclaves. We have apartment blocks. We have street blocks. And there's crews that control those blocks. That's always been around. And then what's unique south of the border of there is you have the blue steel highway in the United States from Florida all the way up. And unlike Western Canada, you can go by 
head gun shows, no background checks, nothing, secondhand sales, garage sale, whatever the case may be, transaction of guns. And we'll put those in uh, parentheses, legally do that. But you also have the movement of illicit firearms, like surreal, uh, from into Toronto, into Montreal. Then we come into the prairies. And the prairies, again, uh, wide expanse, again, a lot of hunting. And gun crime there for, you know, for a significant amount is cut down cooies, cut down shotguns, cut down bolt action rifles or in some, like I was going through my log books. I'm going like, like uh, yeah, cut down, cut down, cut down, cut down, cut down. And then, okay, I'll, oh, an AK. Okay, I got a Tech 9. Okay, I've got a Galil. But the vast majority, right, you know, of law of what we hear, gun crime is still cut down guns. Then we come into the West and we come into Alberta and we come into BC. There's money here. In early, mid 2000, we started seeing a significant rise in self-fabricated guns, ghost guns, but not polymer. All the guns we were getting were AKs, 1911s, uh, Scorpions. And we're going like, well, hang on a second. And then we started seeing the 6-hour P250 with the drop-in trigger mechanism that had been completely re-engineered. Re then late 2000, especially on the West, Washington State, Oregon, California, Nevada, closed the gun show loophole. So our folks that were going down to the States to buy guns at the gun shows or having other people straw purchase for them, that was cut off for them. So then what we started seeing, and it was happening right across Canada, was an increase of straw purchasing, where you have persons who have their pals, and they are, they go out, purchase ammunition and firearms for illicit purposes. They go out, they go in, boom, they hand it over and they get a cut. Then came, uh, at the same time, we were dealing with the increase of the, the straw purchases, the uh, closing of the gun show loophole. In Western Canada, we also happened to arrest a number of dual citizens or Americans that were moving the guns back and forth and incarcerated them. So it changed the sources. It was surreal how things changed. But it drove up straw purchasing. Then COVID hit. And nothing's going across the border. So again, straw purchasing, going up, it's going up, it's going up, because everything had to be locally sourced. It was the best way to get it. It was the only way to get it. But then we started seeing polymer 80s. And, and that really took off big in Eastern Canada. And Eastern Canada... Uh, Montreal has had some incredible files over the past, not just with the polymer 80s, but they had an individual who was running a factory making Tech 9s, 3D and CNC fabrications. Uh, there was another factory uh, just outside of Montreal making AKs from AK flats and suppressors. So we had these unique dynamic changes across the country. But COVID and the, the rapid development in the ability to self-fabricate took off polymer 80 kits so in 2019 uh, a group of us i i sat down with the head of the, one of the the specialized firearms enforcement lab and i said we're getting in west is becoming irrelevant because all this is happening we need to teach the guys and girls across canada within n west bring them all together and they know, have to know how to do an investigation, what to look for, how to build it, all the dynamics. So they were doing uh, the polymer 80s, CNC fabrication on the Ghost Gunner 2. I got Ottawa to buy the Ghost Gunner 2. So we did the Ghost Gunner 2 
uh, resin cast. Um, and we did that in a zero vacuum so they didn't they, they didn't blow apart on us. Suppressors, you name it, we were making it. The NWS members in 2019, 2020, 2021 became the best, in my opinion, the best skilled investigators in Canada for self-fabricated firearms. There was so nobody. Frank, can you explain for the people who don't know what Polymer 80 is? So Polymer 80 is actually a company and they will um, fabricate a kit. And within that kit, you'll have a lower receiver where the trigger mechanism group goes into the, the slide block and all of that. And it's not completely finished. And by using simple hand tools, uh, you can use a Dremel tool, you can use a hand file, you can finish the lower receiver. Then you take the components, drop them in, you have your trigger group, your hammer, your slide, put on your slide, put, every, it, it, put everything together and go to the range and fire it off. And it does not take a lot of skill. And to on top of that, if you're having a hiccup, welcome to open source. Because the tutorials are through the roof. You can find whatever you want on how to make a Polymer 80, the AR, or the, the Glock. And then we just started seeing it even get more detailed and more detailed, where now you didn't have to buy the kit because the kits were starting to get a little, the ATF were coming down on Polymer 80 and a couple other companies. So folks were going, oh, um, can I 3D print? Well, sure. All you have to do is download the, the STL CAD program, do your slicing, have the right material, make sure your table's set up, make sure your heat level is proper so that you have good mm -hmm. integrity and that the process starts. And early on, yeah, we had a couple that were left a lot to be desired. But now, I, you know, if I hear somebody, when somebody says, oh, yeah, they're useless, I'm going, you haven't got the slightest idea what you're talking about because you've <laughs> never investigated it and you've never had one in your hands and you've never fired it. And then add to that the Glock switches now. 30 minutes, 30 minutes to print, assemble, take off the back plate, off the Glock, insert the switch, go to the range and rip off a 31 round mag. Yeah. I'm, we're going to come back to this in a second. I, I just want to back up for one moment because yeah. you were talking about the flow of guns from, for example, the US and East, East, West, that sort of thing. What does the international network of the trafficking of delivery of stuff look like if you were to consider South America, Asia, uh, Africa, Europe, UK, like what, what, what does the flow, what does that network look like? Okay. So let's, let's look, let's use for Brazil. So, uh, Brazil, of course, a new president. Um, and when Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro was in, I hope I'm saying that right. Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. He got rid of a lot of the regulations. So there was a lot of firearms coming into the country. And of course, with all those firearms coming in, there was, a, you know, ended up being a fair amount of diversion, but not just within Brazil. They were going off to the other countries. And when you would look at the movement, uh, so I, I, I read the reports from Armament Research, Small Arms Survey. I like staying on top of what's going on internationally. And these folks are switched on. We're looking about uh, how the guns are moving. Are they, you know, uh, vehicle and what they call the ant trade by humans walking across the border, uh, running along the rivers, all the different methodologies and the flow that they take, because it's not just the guns and ammunition that's flowing. It's also contraband, the drugs that are moving. So you, if, if an established link, an established chain is in place, you'll follow it. Uh, case in point, the United States Navy just did a massive interdiction uh, in Libya for uh, AK-47s and shoulder-mounted weaponry that was being diverted. And they do the diversions at sea, do the transfers, um, the craziest. 
craziest diversion Canadian that I've ever seen was we had a ship come up from uh, the southern United States, Halifax Harbor. And then we had a bunch of guys go out on jet skis in scuba gear, dive in, go out underneath the boats. They were dumping the canisters off the boats, muckle onto the canisters, go back to the jet skis, hook them on, and off you went. In firearms trafficking, imagination is the only limitation. <laughs> Good saying. Um, and then now, you know, there's a lot of discussion with what's going on in Eastern Europe with Ukraine, mm -hmm. with a significant number of uh, the weaponry that's going in for these people to save their country. And is it getting diverted? Quite possible. Some of it is. Um, if the, the antagonisms come to an end, are we going to see an increase across Europe of this weaponry? Without a doubt. No, yeah. that, nobody's that foolish. Yes, it's going to move. And we're going to see, because we had for years, we had issues with regard to a diversion of military stores. Look at the case in point when Russia, um, East Germany collapsed. And those weapon stores, it was a free-for-all when the East Bloc came down. It was a free-for-all. The armories were opened up and stuff went out. I had a business here in, in the Lower Mainland um, that was moving offshore because as long as the weaponry didn't touch the shore of Canada, the United States, he was moving weaponry offshore. Mm -hmm. So... You know, and I got to see the books. I got to see the movement. I got to sit down with the United States officials and go, you need to look at that because this is the issue. Yeah. And so, yeah. Is 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 Asia an exporter of parts and things like that? Are they a big exporter or is it too difficult to get stuff in there? It's tough to get things in there, but there's one particular group of people who are phenomenally skilled at building guns, the Filipinos. They have a long history of uh, being able to fabricate very, very good copies, very good functional copies. And uh, I won't use his name, a mate of mine, his brother is one of them. And I got to see some of the video and they said, yeah, Frank, we decided to go for a range day. And I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. So, um, and there was a little while we were actually seeing uh, items from the Philippines going into Australia. Okay. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, and I mean, then you go, um, the lab here just got another Kyber pass gun. It was a, a Glock, but he was like, Frank, every bit on that gun was handcrafted. He said it was ugly as sin. It worked, but he goes, it was so obviously a Kyber pass gun. And I've, I've maybe had a handful of those in my, in my time I've come across, but, um, isn't that where they made the, uh, the, that slam fire shotgun, that Richardson, something that, that, the old, it's, it looks like a toy almost, but it does. And, and, uh, the, the trio, the tubes, the, the bang sticks, they'll always be around. I mean, we've had guys in Winnipeg building them out of bicycle air pumps. So going back with the change of what has happened in BC, in the lower mainland right now for illicit gun seizures, handgun seizures, it's almost a 50-50 split between industrial manufactured and um, polymer and um, PMFs, privately made firearms, or ghost guns. Right. There's there's been a lot. I mean, we we've seen stuff uh, in in Europe. There's just been a growth. There's been all. I mean, the U.S. It's legal. So there's people who are there's clubs and things like that where people make their own 3D printed guns. And yeah, to your point before, things have come a long way since the day of that liberator. Uh, you well, know, where where somebody 3D printed a gun and it, it you know breaks apart after a couple of shots. It, these things are now like. But they're just as, I mean, you can see people firing these automatic weapons and oh. they perform just as good as the real thing. Well, I've only ever seized one liberator. 
And it wasn't firearms related. It was a guy who uh, had actually sexually assaulted a number of women. He ran a 3D printing company and he actually went to one of the victim's homes with intent to kill her. So she wouldn't be a witness, ended up getting into a fight in the door with the father. It's a, it's a crazy story for another day. But he had one. And that's the only liberty. Uh, liberty. So I would, because we, here we were dealing so much with the CNC fabricated guns. I was laughing because everybody losing their mind over the polymers. And I'm going, folks, we're so, we've, we've got the best of the best. But our gangsters had this. Mm -hmm. They had money. But then again, COVID changed everything. Okay. So Frank, what if you had to just guess at a number, if we look at gun crime in general, two questions, what percentage of guns are illegal versus legal? And then what percentage of the guns are ghost guns, 3D printed, self-fabricated? Uh, th those are the two questions I have in mind. Depends where you are. Okay. If you are in the prairies, and I mean, you're going to have cooies, you're going to have uh, CILs, you're going to have shotguns, you're going to, because for one, a lot of the guys out there don't have the money to purchase the materials. They just don't. So it depends where you are. Um, so let's go, let's go outside the border. Let's go to, and I see my friend Ian is here. We go out to Great Britain and we go to Australia. I was, there was a couple of Eastern European gentlemen that were smuggling polymer 80 uh, handguns secreted in toy motorcycles into the country. But then we, it, the world changed. And then we started seeing what they call the FGC-9. And the FGC stands for, excuse my language, fuck gun control. And so the FGC-9, a self-fabricated firearm. And uh, one of my folks from, uh, well, actually, um, Patrick helped me out because we're getting them with either airsoft trigger groups or with AR trigger groups. We are getting now barrels, blank barrels coming in from China that can be used to make the FGCs because they've already been interdicted in Australia. So they're not rifled, but cut them, crown them if you want to, run the button reamer through it, get your rifling, increase your accuracy. Uh, we've had conflicts in South America where they said, okay, we've, we've made FGC nines, but as soon as we've killed somebody, uh, we'll grab their weapon. So ARs, AKs, things of that nature. So uh, percent, it's, it's different. Again, it depends where you are. Okay. But uh, would you say then it's fair to say that, but there is a trend showing that more and more are appearing as time goes on. Yes. Yes. Oh, definitely. And I am always listening to, you know, all the guns used in crime are uh, smuggled across the border, smuggled across the border. Across. No, they're not. I've done close to 3000 firearms investigations and still support on certain firearms investigations. And a lot are locally sourced. Yes, right. they come across. I mean, if I look at uh, Project Epoch, for example, now, this is going back 2006. I had three companies illegally diverting, illegally importing firearms into the country. 1,772 firearms, handguns, and semi automatic rifles in the wind. After you and I and our kids are long gone, these are still going to be circulating. Mm. So it's an interesting point because, and, and I wonder how. Other people like that are they're are going to watch this, you know, around the world, you know, from different parts of the world, um, depending on the legislation that they have or what the governments are particularly doing. So, for example, here in Canada, uh, you know, the, most recently the government has been trying to ban certain types of firearms. And in I just want to ask you, like, in your opinion, like, because a lot of these are being fabricated, 
or they're coming up across the border, um, is what they're banning actually going to make a difference in in you know a big difference in in the gun crime? Yeah, you have know? to open that can of worms. I have to open. I have to open that can of worms. Okay. <laughs> The number one, I'm going I'm to lay it out there right away because I've always stood by this. The number one gun, semi-automatic rifle used in gun crimes in Canada, and you can ask any firearms investigator from east to west, north to south, which is the one that we seize the most? It's the SKS rifle. The SKS rifle has killed most police officers within recent history, uh, not Heidi, may she rest in peace, and a significant number of other people. The I'm not going to get into the politics of why the SKS wasn't on the original list, but I actually asked, why is it not on the list? We look at a number of the firearms, and I'm going to go case in point, and because this has come up a couple of times. The Mossberg 702 Plinkster, a 22 semi-automatic rifle. And Mossberg ended up fabricating because they knew the market was the the market was the market the purchasing market demands what they want and businesses fabricators will build according to what people want and military type furniture on firearm sells so they created the model 70 plankster tactical 22 and the gentleman who deemed it as restricted and now prohibited, we had a major, major falling out because of this, face to face. And there's people I know, they were in the room with me and they saw it. And I said, I said I'm gonna give you an, an analogy again. I said, it is merely a pig with lipstick. It's the same gun just different furniture. So they're looking at semi-automatic, magazine-fed, five round, capable of five rounds or more, center fire. And you go, okay. And then there's the argument about, um, well, you don't need these high calibers, you know, high energy calibers, um, the 50 Barrett, things of that nature. But they're also capturing big game and uh, you know african big game i am not a big game hunter in africa i'm not if there are persons as long as they're doing it legal morally and ethically fill your boots because there's farms they will excuse me they raise that for that purpose fine i'm not going to judge on that but you are throwing in without truly truly doing the forethought of what do you what do you want to do? What are you encompassing? I'm looking at hunting rifles, and I'm not talking about man hunting rifles. I'm talking about hunting rifles. And I go, you know, I see, I go, I would go to shot show every year, and I would see these novelty semi-automatic shotguns and different kinds of crazy rifles and going, okay, it's, it's the United States. You can use your second amendment, right? You can fill your boots. Canada, the Supreme court has clearly stated firearm ownership in Canada is a highly regulated privilege, done deal. But it doesn't mean that the laws work the way they're supposed to, i.e. a full patch motorcycle gang member can own a gun and own a handgun. And I know some who do. I know a full patch OMG who has prohibited firearms because he has, he's been grandfathered. I know individuals because within a certain time frame, they didn't commit a violent crime. They've got guns. Right. We need to better educate the youth, we need to better educate even adults. Video gaming, I'll be, hey, in the military, we used video games. 
tank fan, um, pilots, they're in a, in a flight sim. It's all a big video game. Mm -hmm. And removed, as it pushed on and pushed on and pushed on, it removed the natural hesitation going, I'm not going to pick that up. Well, but I've picked it up in a, in, a, in a war game, so it's good. Anybody who tells me that video games doesn't have an effect really, again, hasn't done the job on the street. Should we go back to teaching safety in school or in um, institutes of higher learning? Because we have cadets, air cadets, Navy, Army cadets, and they go to the range and they learn handling. And I don't see a lot of cadets getting in trouble. Not to say they don't, but I'm not seeing it. So just blanket banning serves no purpose. It comes down to changing how society interprets, reacts, understands. I mean, a case in point, look what they've just done here in Van in BC for so many grams of uh, any kind of drug, illegal. And you go on, but they never did the full process. Right. They just made it easier to go, okay, we're just going to accept it and we'll go from there. doesn't work that way. Yeah. You have to have tiers you know, and it's no different than when if you have a firearms investigation, you have tiers. You have the guys and girls who are the boots on the ground. You have the analysts who are the boots on the ground are bringing the information to so that they're gathering information to create intelligence. Then you've got, the, you know, the analysts come back and talk to the investigators. And they're looking at all the links that work together. Then you have the labs, the forensics labs. The forensics labs have to teach the boys and girls, the boots on the ground, what do I need to have you seize? How do you seize it? When do you seize? How do you handle it? If you're not sure how to handle it, here's somebody you can contact. We, we, and then you go on to the judiciary. We need to sit down with the judiciary and go, okay, we need to bring you up to speed on how to do what firearms investigations involve and the nuances. Then we have to go to the IT tech on the team. How do we seize and preserve and obtain the communications between individuals? How do we get the information off the printers, the 3D printers? How do we get the information out of the computer? We need to up that level because this is a new world. It's changed. Then on top of that, we need to bring the community into it. Like out here, we have a great organization called Safer Schools Together where they deal with school threats. I also do consulting work for them when we have youth who are threatening to do self-harm or harm to others with firearms. And I'm brought in to do the review of the footage, the photographs, the, the language, all those sort of things. It's a multi-tiered, and I do not see that happening. And it's just individual groups doing it, trying to do the best they can um, to address that. I mean, you look at um, in Toronto, uh, what is it, 500, Sean Garris, um, about gang life. Like he really drives it home. We have uh, here in, in where everything started was in gang life with Combined Forces Special Enforcement with Lindsay Houghton. These are great people who understand it has to be an all-encompassing. Right. Just having a gun cop, big deal. Right. Everybody has to do this together. We have to communicate with the guy. And guns move. Guns don't have a shelf life. Right. That might, that's a really great point. The 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 fact that this is, and that's I think that's part of the the thing that rubs me the wrong way when I see you know hey we're going to ban a, this type of gun or whatever. It's a multifaceted problem that you know like you talked about. You talked about education, starting starting young and letting people know what it is, handling, letting letting people understand what guns are because sometimes for a lot of people that have never touched a gun or even been in front of a gun, it's just like a mystery or whatever it is. Um, that the issue there's a this social aspect that we have to address right to fix help yeah. fix the problem. Them. And then there's, of course, the investigation side. So and, and on that, what kind of participation or what does it look like, you know, like RCMP or, you know, dealing with 
outside agencies dealing with people in the US, dealing with people overseas, people in Asia, stuff like that? What kind of participation and cooperation is there globally? Okay, so uh, within North America, uh, National Weapons Enforcement Support Team, NOS, RCMP, under the Canadian Firearms Program, have an MLAT with the ATF. So the because of uh, rules in the United States, the, the firearms traces that are executed by the United States, the ATF by their tracing unit, technically, it's, the way it's written, it's almost like they're not allowed to share it. Uh, but they are permitted. NWEST will do, uh, will assist with an investigation. And we will do a document called 1726. We'll document everything with regard to the file that we know. Then we send that off to the tracing unit. The tracing unit will forward that off to the ATF and they will go through their records. Now, unfortunately, the ATF records, because of political issues, which I'm not going to go into, uh, it's still a paper trail I, or um, uh, old school microfiche. I can't make this up. And they have to pull the documentation. And what they do is they get who manufactured it, uh, and also on a number of firearms, depending on where it's made, it'll also have what's an importer stamp. So let's say we'll go with a Taurus, classic Taurus. So it's uh, we run the trace number, we have the importer stamp, we provide that to the ATF. The ATF will pull that company's records, we'll look at it. On this date, it was sold to this person. This is the identification that they used. That is the last time we'll know. If we find out that the person has done multiple purchases, that'll also be noted on the trace report. And that sometimes takes us onto another path because we see that the person's doing multiple straw purchasing. So, uh, and then sometimes we'll see links with that per the per who person who did the purchase to another other firearms that were seized and crossed paths. So we get to see that. So, yeah, the NWEST and the ATF have this MLAT in place, the, the, uh, the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, sharing back. Now, between nations, you have to establish an MLAT, Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. So um, with the Caribbean, I've been working with the Caribbean uh, the last year quite a bit with uh, installing a firearms trafficking in for investigation units, um, dealing with their firearms roadmap, where countries have are looking at protocols that they can either uh, enact, accept, and act on to deal with illicit firearms in the country and coming into their country. And they will have, when they recognize, like I'll go somebody from, uh, we'll go Jamaica. Okay, so in uh, Jamaica, they have an ATF agent posted in Jamaica. So they have the agreement in place, but some countries don't. So they have to create an MLAT between them so that they can exchange the information. Okay. So that's how okay. it works. Okay. Let me ask you about um, other things. So for example, before you were talking about mufflers or suppressors, you're talking about, you know, other little components that people are making. And, uh, you know, they are, uh, and a lot of what you do too has to be interpreting the law, right? Yeah. Because I mean, I, I think that's a that's the important part here is that, and you've been involved in some cases, and I want to ask you about maybe one of those cases um, where somebody somebody may order something or somebody may fabricate something, and there is a line between you know when a part or a component becomes illegal because it's now a part versus you know a block of material or something like yeah. that and so i want to ask you about maybe some of those cases and, and some of the background uh because i i know you've been involved in at least a two or three that had some significant impact in canadian law yeah the big one um is regina versus Kankaid. so mr Kankaid uh lived here in british columbia outside the lower mainland uh, prohibited firearms and prohibited firearms because he had actively been involved and actually still involved with making threats viable. And I put that into strong, viable threats to certain law enforcement officers. So he was prohibited firearms. Canada Border Services ended up interdicting a, uh, what was it? Seven. Yes, seven. 30-round AR magazines 
but just the bodies. No bottom plate, no spring, no follower plate. And so, and uh, I was brought into the investigation, uh, was part of the search. And there was a number of other items seized as well. And I was asked to give an opinion with regard to the magazine bodies. Are they prohibited devices? And I learned a long time ago, within the criminal code, one, the guiding force is legal, moral, and ethical. But then also being able to look in the corners and read it for what it's worth, what it says. And with regard to prohibited devices, it doesn't say a complete prohibited device. It just says um, a, a component. It actually says component. And I went, son of a gun. So... I reached out to an incredible, our, our legal mind within the National Weapons Enforcement. And I said, here's my thought process. Tell me if I'm on the right page. And he went, Frank, yeah, you, you're there. You're there, you're there, you're there. And I went, okay. He says, you're gonna go for it? I said, oh yeah, I'm gonna go for it. And so uh, in court with my lady, and because I've brought in as an expert, I can make um, opinions, but based on fact. And I use, again, here I go with the horrible analogies. I said, my lady, uh, I asked, have you been to the beach? And have you picked up a large size shell off the beach and put it to your ear? You know, like we all do to listen to the ocean. And she looks at me and says, yes, I have. And I went and I had the magazine body and I picked it up. And I have this imaginary shell in the other hand. And I go, if there's no living entity in the shell, is it still a shell? Her eyes went and she said, I got you. <laughs> Done deal. And of course, you've seen the case law um, because Mr. Kincaid appealed it. And then he also appealed it on the French language issue for the interpretation. Uh, the problem is Mr. Kincaid, um, didn't know I was bilingual. And so we supported on that and he lost. And that changed a lot of the direction in Canada for especially Canada border services agencies, because now using Regina versus Kincaid, you can interdict the components being used to complete prohibited devices. Right. Yeah. And I mean, this was this was pretty clear that it's a, you know, magazine for 30, you know, uh, 30 rounds or whatever. And it's 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 not a block of material. It, it didn't take much to finish to complete. I think it was what you add a spring. You it was a couple of little things like yeah, yeah the, the yeah. bottom plate, the spring and the follower plate. And I also right. told I said, my lady, it's not a light stand. It's not a door wedge. It is designed manufactured and uh, designed and manufactured for one purpose only to be the container for 30 rounds of uh for that case was either 223 or 556 five, ammunition to be used in an ar rifle and he happened to be building an ar rifle as well so so what do you think about now that people are that 3d printing they're fabricating this stuff or whatever i mean it's it's not getting sent across the border. It's they're building them in their basements and their garages and stuff like that. So it's not something that you are going to apprehend, and you're not going to stop people from buying 3D printers. No. So no. I mean, yeah, yeah. So the the question is, in terms of the law, does the law really need to change? You know, I I hear you know Australia did it, um, Great Britain, if I'm correct. Uh, with the language with regard to having programs for the 3D printing. Good luck with that. You cannot stop this. You can't. It's impossible. Information now will flow to its heart's content, however it will be diverted, whatever the case. You know, I'll put it on here and I'll send it to somebody. You know, um, it's just, there's just no way. I had approached management within the program a number of years ago, especially when we were really starting to see the kickoff of these uh, ghost guns, self-fabricated PMFs. 
And I said, why don't we consider, and I used the, the basis, when we, when somebody buys a Glock handgun, the lower is serialized with a plate. The slide is serialized with the exact same number. And the barrel is serialized with the same number. Why don't we consider regulating the pressure bearing component? At minimum, the barrel. It's not saying that the person can't build the gun if they want to. So i.e. the Polymer 80, and that was another great project that, I, that I, I drove, was all Polymer 80 kits coming into Canada, uh, the ARs are banned outright, and there's a very, very particular reason for that. The uh, Polymer 80 Glock handgun kits are have to be serialized to come into Canada. And the person who wants to buy the kit has to be licensed and it, it's registered, transferred into their name. Why can we not do the mandatory marking and the registration of barrels? It's just, you know what? I've always looked at it. Will you win the war? No. Can we drive them a little further back to the Stone Age to make it harder? Yes. Now, is the barrel a component that people will typically still buy or that they'll still purchase? Because I've seen a lot of the, like you said, the low, the, the lower receiver or like those types of things will be plastic or 3D printed, but you still need a metal component for the you, like the barrel and you, you can't get away from that so far. You, you can't get away from it. I mean, um, Patrick was kind enough to share with me some of the ARs now, the, the uppers that are 3D printed, but the handguns, again, that sheer strength, they're, they're metal. The slide, the, the spring, um, your follower, they're still metal. I mean, we have guys who are 3D fabricating the slide block and oh, that, that the, the rail, that, that the slide is able to, to move, have its movement back and forth, things of that nature. But, and those parts in North America, and, and, and I'll consider just in Canada, are not regulated. Other countries, they are, but not here. So it's, but again, I'm not saying ban them. If the person, the majority of gun owners in this country, again, are legal, moral, and ethical. They follow the rule to the law. They are conscientious. They are uh, very sensitive to making sure gun safety in the home, gun safety in the field. They are just adamant. They, I mean, they are, I, I, if I want to, I'll call them professional through and through in the love of their hobby. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree 100%. I, I've never met a person who was passionate about guns or whatever that I didn't trust. They, they were always following the rules. They were always very educational, always good with sharing information, everything else. And so they're not the people I worry about. We know who the people are that you have to worry about. That's the that's the problem. It's, it's the, the ones that you don't know who have them or the ones who get them illegally, who don't follow the rules. And if anyone is, I, I've got my, my pal here or whatever for the, the restricted and non-restricted. And anyone who goes through the process knows that if you're a criminal, why the hell would you bother going through all that trouble, like taking courses and, and everything else? It doesn't make any sense. We actually had out in Winnipeg, we actually had the criminals hire a number of individuals to do the PAL courses, and then they would rotate through them for the straw purchases. So any system, no matter what it is, any system can be manipulated, no matter what. But it comes down to having to knowledge to recognize what am I seeing? What is going on? And for me, I think what really drove my passion for chasing the illegal activity, it wasn't so much the firearm. It was everything else related to it. The documentation, uh, the manipulation of the documentation, the transgressions, all that 
you know, I would love, I, I always enjoyed sitting in on an interview and I would stay in the background and the investigator would be uh, doing the interview of the person involved in the illicit activity and he'd give a dog and pony. And then they go, they look at me and go, Frank, your turn. And I go, here comes, boom, 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 boom. And they get this deer in the headlights look and go, do you know who I am? And they go, oh God, <laughs> you know, it's... Let, let me ask you about another case, Frank. There, there was another case, I think, was it called uh, Hasselwander? Is it Hasselwander? Hasselwander. Hasselwander. What can you tell us about that particular case? So Hasselwander was very, very, uh, when was that? That was, two, oh my God, I think I've got it here. I know I put it aside because I want to draw on it. And uh, Regina versus Kincaid leaned heavily on Hasselwander. So um, in that regard, it was the ease of being able to do a conversion, the ease of doing, to build something or to convert something from semi-automatic to automatic. And so how did it go? Uh, and it spoke down to, and I'm, I'm quoting here, Corey J stated, any uncertainty as to whether the word capable means either immediately capable or readily capable is resolved as soon as the word is interpreted in the light of the purpose and the goals of the prohibited weapons of the code. Therefore, there's no need to resort to a rule of st strict constriction, a uh, construction. So meaning is, if you are able to build it with a minimum amount of tools and skill set, you're good to go. And I used Hasselwander when, to, to fall back on when I dealt with the poly, the uh, establishing the controls of the Polymer 80, uh, the Polymer 80 uh, for the Glock, for the AR, and then the Scorpion CNC kits. And when I went to the firearms lab, I went, I need your newest technician. Not a lot of machining skills, newest technician, still going through the process of their probationary period. And by using open source, I want them to build the guns. And I need it all documented, start to finish. And they did that. The Scorpion machine pistol, sees, uh, the 60, what was fully automatic. The AR in its 80% unfinished state is an automatic weapon in the first instance, period. I gave that presentation in the video to the boss uh, in Washington state a number of years uh, in, uh, they'd come up from Washington state, their jaws hit the ground. Luckily, a lot of people haven't figured that out yet. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about airsoft guns before, and I had a I had an experience because I wasn't aware. I uh, it was actually one of these laser tag places for the kids to go play. So it was a birthday thing that I took my son at. But attached to this place was an airsoft uh, yeah. store. So I walked through there, Frank, and I was shocked because I said these don't look like play guns these look like, like if somebody's holding this out on the street they're going to get shot because it looks like the real deal and i'm wondering about that so not there, there's that issue there where, where they just look like the real thing um but what about converting them like how how hard or how difficult is it to take something like an airsoft and then convert it into you know a prohibited weapon or okay let's let's take airsoft back a while a military kosovo we're rolling down the street and we have kids pointing airsofts at us and you can't twitch. And so what we started doing is we started trace, uh, trading school supplies for the airsofts in theater. Uh, the British, uh, it was integrated with 4th Armored Brigade and then the 408 Helicopter Squadron. 4th uh, Armored Brigade, their mess hall, the wall was just lined with all the airsoft we'd have taken off from the kids. It was surreal. And you think of it, you're in an evening patrol, 
things are hinky, shots are going off, and you see one of these things pointed at you from a windowsill. And you're going like, uh, you're making the calls, but then you see a kid's head come out. And you're going like, oh. We've had individuals in Canada and the United States point airsofts at law enforcement and lose their lives. And I feel so much for those law enforcement officers because the last thing you want to do is to take the life of a, a young person. Mm-hmm. You know, and some of them, they, they want to do suicide by cop. It happens. Um, regulation. What about re- regulation on these things? So I've, uh, London, Ontario, and I don't know if they followed through with it. London, Ontario actually uh, did a bylaw a number of years ago to ban the sales of airsofts, but I don't know if it went through or if it's still in force. What we started seeing, though, especially with the airsofts, and um, I've already, my friends with uh, the Association of Firearms Toolmarks Examiners Association, uh, and I've shared around the globe already, one of my counterparts, we've seen the importation of AR lower receivers fabricated in Taiwan being interdicted by Canada Border Services Aid. This is all very, very recent. Switched out. Uh, One kit came with the upper and the lower. That first kit that came in the upper and the lower mounted the the complete barrel gas assembly on that. It didn't work quite right. It fed. It it fired single shot, but then we totally switched it out and put a uh, Colt complete upper receiver on it. It worked fine as a semi-automatic, no modifications required. Uh, Just the the trigger group had to be changed as well. So just dropped in AR components. On the second one, it was a complete AR unit, uh, airsoft. We simply removed the upper and within the, on the lower receiver, there was a blocker bar. All you had to do was unscrew it, unscrewed the blocker bar, and then we just dropped everything in. And actually, that's probably being tested as we speak in full automatic. Okay. Frank, we're we're getting a little bit on in time, but I do have a couple more questions for you. And one of them has to do with your current role with uh, the uh, United Nations, um, what's it called? It's Regional Center for Peace, right? Yeah. uh, Yeah. It's, It's a long handle. Yeah, yeah, but the so you're are you you're dealing with most countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So, like, what kinds of things are you working on? Well, um, my last trip uh, was actually to uh, Jamaica, and to sit down with them to creating a uh, firearms trafficking and investigation unit, best practices, and then also they wanted uh, the characteristics uh, of an armed individual lecture, so did that with them, sat down with some of the forensic folks. So that was in Jamaica, and then went to go see, at with the Jamaican Defense Force, went to go see their uh, weapons destruction system this year. Prior to that, I was in Haiti and across the Caribbean, and this was just before everything went, absolutely surreal. Uh, I helped with a couple of uh, associates from UN Lyric. We rewrote on four, because they asked us, rewrote the gun law and uh, the legislation, because there was a lot of where they were pulling just generic things and I think they just didn't make sense. So we fine tuned it for them. And then we sat down with the different agencies, law enforcement, military, Uh, governmental agencies, including uh, the civilian agencies, to what we call the Caribbean Roadmap. So for them to identify what are some of the issues that they're dealing with in their country and how they want to address it. And uh, it was actually earlier this week, actually a Monday or Tuesday, Haiti actually signed uh the national the nap agreement to their part of uh the uh road caribbean roadmap oh and in jamaica uh this is something that i'm really following and i'm hoping i can get involved in a little bit more it's called project salient so they've picked two particular neighborhoods that are pretty rocking 
And it's from grassroots up, engaging with the kids, engaging with um, the, the community leaders, just really drawing everybody into this. And it, it'll also involve, you know, you have youth, they need work, they need jobs, you need to occupy them. So looking at all these things to address it holistically, which is what I want to see here. Mm -hmm. So that, and then um, did uh, put together uh, ghost gun fabric, uh, ghost gun fabrication presentations, you know, and it's not just the fact how they're made, but how to investigate them, what to look for, what to see, who needs to be involved, how, you know, and overall the firearms team. And then also at the end of it all is having an academic group come in to do an assessment. Is it working? Is it not working? What does work? What needs to be tweaked? Because this is um, for everybody to play in the sandbox. Everybody has to have a say and everybody has to see is what we are doing. Is it actually working? Right. I got a question here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pose this. Uh, this is from Diego. Let me bring it up here. And I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but uh, maybe you get a sense of what's going on. So he's at Diego's asking about the illegal trafficking of U.S. weapons in Mexico. If that's bigger than legal expert, and I don't know. That must be a. I mean, <sighs> that's 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 a tough one. Considering in Mexico, in Mexico, if I remember right, Mexico City has only one place that you can buy a gun, and the rules are re like legally buy a gun. And the regulations in there are surreal. But, I mean, we uh, saw, a, a, you know, we, we saw a number of projects. The ETF previously mucked up a little bit on one and following the guns into, the, uh, into Mexico. Uh, but it, it, we had, we had illicitly fabricated full auto counterfeit ARs made in Europe come into Montreal, from Montreal to Mexico. And the only reason we caught on to it was some of the guns didn't work. So that particular cartel was not happy with the Canadian who facilitated that. And that particular Canadian was dealt with cartel. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, I, guns? Yeah, because of the controls in place. Yeah, I'd say if. I, I mean, mean, it's got to be, up. it's got to be a huge industry. I mean, it's got to be. Are we talking like hundreds of millions of dollars? Are we talking? Uh... Oh, it depends what you want to pay for the gun, because mm -hmm. every country has a different market. I mean, if I go to Africa and I want to buy an AK uh, in Angola, I'm not busting a hundred dollars to get an AK. Yeah. So who's? Sorry, yeah? who's who's the largest exporter of guns right now? Oh, I, 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 to define it, I, I couldn't tell you. But you look at um, Germany, you look at Austria, you look at the United States. You know, there's a number of countries who are, you know, for the international market. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if somebody wants to look at that, there's a website, Arms Trade, and you can actually go through Arms Trade. And it, it tells you about contracts that are coming up and who's moving what. And it's not. And don't forget, Canada, Canada moves a lot of equipment. And it may not necessarily be the weaponry, but everything associated there, too. Canada moves a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, Frank, look, we're getting on in time and uh, I want to put up your LinkedIn up here on the screen. So for those of you that want to get in touch with Frank, um, he is on LinkedIn. If you connect with him there, then, um, you know, you can, you can chat with him and, and find out more information, but Frank, what can I say? I, I, uh, we could keep going here because you got a, a wealth of information and a ton of interesting topics. It's, it's a very complicated topic. Um, cause like you said, it, it's multifaceted, right? There, there's a lot of different, it has a lot of different tentacles. It's, it's a big monster. It is. And, uh, it comes down to everybody that are, is doing the job. I, I wish them all the very best, dedicated, stay sane, keep your mind, watch out for one another, 
And the other thing is, if you see something new that catches you going, this is different, let the rest of the world know. Because as Eugene knows, my, my favorite quote is, it's not if you're going to see it, it's when you're going to see it. And the only way we can pick up on that is if we share the information. So like with the airsofts, I fan that out to every continent and they're like, what? And I went, yeah, folks, it's, it's here. It's here. And you don't have to bet. You're just buying it. All you need are the bits and pieces. Eugene, yep. thank you so much for the opera. This is my first time doing this. Really? I hope I didn't <laughs> muck it up for you. Not at all. You've been fantastic. And I, I truly appreciate your time. And uh, we're, I'm, I'm so glad that I met you online. And, you know, it's, I guess this is one of the, the great advantages of the internet, right? You meet people that you never, you know, knew about before or whatever. And you've been a great source of information. I know going forward, uh, I'm definitely going to be leaning on you for for other things. And folks, if if you have anything for uh, for Frank, he's been an, an incredible resource. Uh, he posts online fairly regularly and comments on different things. So, uh, yeah, look, uh, Frank, do me a favor hang back because I want to chat with you just, but uh, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you everybody. And take good care. I haven't been to Trinidad yet. I need to go. <laughs> Was that Leopold? That must be Leopold. There he is. Yeah, that's Leopold. Good stuff. All right, Frank, we'll see you in a bit. Okay, folks, that does it for this one. Uh, great talk. We we went a little bit more than than usual, but lots to talk about. A really good discussion. And thank you all for the the comments in the uh, comment section. Some really great points there. So, uh, look, we're going to be back soon. Um, lots of different topics, lots of different things. But you can rest assured that uh, you know this talk about illegal firearms, three D printed firearms, ghost guns. It's going to be back again for sure. Have a good one, everyone. Happy Thursday. We'll see you soon. Bye bye.